everyone, and um, as we begin our next session, my name is Richard Benson, and on behalf of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural uh, Theology, I'm privileged to welcome uh, uh, you to another session of this conference. The conference, The Sources and Future of Liberation Theology, The Legacy of Dom Helder Camara. The conference is designed to show how the seminal Brazilian bishop put into motion a liberationist paradigm of thought and action that continued in Latin America and can continue to inspire collaborative theology today. So we're honored now to have as our speaker this morning Maria Clara Benemar. She is an associate professor of theology at Pontificia Universidade Católica do Rio de Janeiro. Now, I have a little bit of Spanish, but I have absolutely no Portuguese, so I'm just roughing my way through there and trying to pretend that I know exactly how those words are supposed to be spoken. So, uh, those of you who speak Portuguese, just pretend I did it okay, and nobody will know the difference. Um, uh, Maria was formerly the the Dean of uh, the Pontifical University Center of Theology and Human Sciences. She's now Vice Dean of the same center. She has served as a Senior Research Fellow here at DePaul University's Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, spending a year with us here. She's also a member of the Fetzer Advisory Council on Humanities with the Fetzer Institute of Kalamazoo, Michigan. In addition, from 2009 to 2011. Maria was a member of Caritas Internationalis' Theological Commission. For four years, she also served as a member of the Journal of the American Academy of Religion and is the former director of the Loyola Center for Faith and Culture at PUC Rio. We, we don't want to talk much about that because this is a Vincentian institution. <laughs> and we don't want to highlight those Jesuit connections too much. Uh, she holds a master's in theology from PUC, the Pontifical University, uh, Catholic University of Rio, uh, a PhD in systematic theology from the Pontifical Universita Gregoriana in Rome, and has completed postdoctoral work uh, at my own alma mater, uh, the Catholic University of Louvain. Her lecture this morning is entitled, Contemplation and Action, the Harmonious Synthesis of Don Helder. Uh, after her lecture this morning, we can use the remaining time for questions. Uh, so together, let us give a very warm welcome to Maria Clara Bingham. We are in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. I promise not to be very Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, my talk intends to reflect a little bit about the mysticism, the spirituality of Don Elder Cameron. When we speak about mysticism and spirituality, we normally think about cloisters, monks, silence, eyes downcast, lips closed, a sacred space where one walks and tiptoe far from the worldly noise. It is undeniable that contemplative life, in stricto sensu, is a great richness brought to church and society. It is undoubtedly an invaluable richness that belongs to the legacy of Christianity. So as many other, of the many other religions, which have also their schools of monasticism, many of them in deep dialogue with Christian monasticism. Thomas Merton, the great North American monk, Trappist, confirms that as a pioneer in dialogue with the Buddhism. Moreover, that would be many other examples to quote. Nevertheless, here and now, the figure we have before the eyes is this Brazilian Northeastern bishop frail, skinny, who spent his whole life speaking, acting, moving, and writing. Someone who took risks through new and shaky grounds, assuming themes not very well considered for clergy and ecclesiastical hierarchy because of its secularity, such as poverty, social injustice, communication, 
culture, violence, and peace. And in spite of that, we start this reflection with the deep conviction that we are in front of a mystic, in addition of one of great stature, a mystic of gigantic proportions, perhaps one of the greatest that Christianity has produced in the troubled 20th century, often defined as the century without God. That is why uh, it is important to ask ourselves, in which sense non the camera can be considered a mystic? In which sense does he meet the definition of mystic we have at the bottom of our hearts and minds? Moreover, to which extent does he bring something new to the same understanding about who is mystic and who is not? First of all, we are going to present, to try to present on Elder's mystical journey according to the classical three steps or three ways named by Thomas Aquinas to describe spiritual life. Purgative way, where ascetics predominate, illuminative way, and unitive way. So let's start with the purgative way. Penances, fasts, and vigils in Don Eldo's life. Elder Cameron's young years were very marked by this, his seminarian formation. As it used to be before Vatican II, this formation was very strong in the ascetic side. Until 1966, that means still after the council finished, this was the way of forming good priests. Because the dominant idea was that the priest should be a man apart, and the clerics separated from the lay people. Seminarians should be trained to be distinct from lay people and separated from non-spiritual life of ordinary Christians. With a very strong personality and being very awake to life, to beauty, to art, to people, Helder Cameron knew the temptations of flesh and had to resort to the teachings of his masters at the seminary. At that time, the objections and observations about priestly celibacy were beginning to rise in the church. However, the Pope Paul VI, already after the Vatican II, was very firm in reaffirming the indissoluble <coughs> link between priesthood and celibacy, as we can read in his encyclical Sacerdotali Celibatus. I read just some lines. I quote, hence we consider that the present law of celibacy should today continue to be linked to the ecclesiastical ministry. This law should support the minister in his exclusive, definitive, and total joy of the unique and supreme love of Christ. It should uphold him in the entire dedication of himself to the public worship of God and to the service of the church. It should distinguish his state of life, both among the faithful and in the world at large." End of quotation. Don Elder was never one who pleaded explicitly and publicly for the end of celibacy. Anyway, the faithfulness to this discipline of the church costed him many fasts and penances, what contributed to his purification for the splendid mystical life he was called to live. If there was so with chastity, the same <coughs> happened with obedience. Many times, he had to come back to the discipline learned in the seminary to overcome conflicts and dissents with his superiors. It was hard also for him to admit he had chosen the wrong way when choosing, in his youth, to belong to the integralist party of fascist configuration. With time and a very faithful prayer life, he discovered that what seemed defense of faith was in fact a great intellectual pride, in addition even ambitious from the political point of view. Already before the ordination, he decided not to allow his, his life to be swallowed by work and multiple activities. Therefore, he devoted every day a time to prayer. There were born his famous vigils, where he prayed, wrote poetry and prose, and which allowed him to enter in a real mystical experience. Moreover, the Eucharistic celebration was always the peak of his day. The Eucharistical mystic of Donald de Camera, according to our point of view, was not yet sufficiently explored by research in theology and spirituality. After meeting Virginia Cortes Lacerda, a great poet and a great woman, 
who was his great friend and partner, he began to form a group of people who met every week at her house to talk about spiritual and mystical texts and to listen to good music. It was the beginning of a group of spiritual friendship that he would cultivate until the end of his life. After this one, there were other groups of gathering around faith and spirituality who helped him a lot and were present in his more notable intuitions. His spiritual director was a famous Brazilian Jesuit, Father Leonel Franca, the founder of the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, the university where I work. And he thought the meditations Father Elder wrote were so deep and good that he asked Virginia to organize and conserve those papers, thank God. We have them because of that. Those were later the meditations of Father Joseph, literary pieces that the Archbishop wrote until the end of his life. It was with this group help and with his sensitivity that in 1936, he discovered Jacques Maritain and mostly the book Integral Humanism, which proposes reconciliation between Catholicism and democracy and criticizes every single form of totalitarianism from either right or left. Maritain pleads for the respect to religious pluralism and the defense of freedom, either individual or communal. The integralistic past of Don Elder was very questioned by that, and he adhered with passion to Maritain's thought, mostly in what he said that the, I quote, Christian renovation of the world should be realized if we adopt the new style of sanctity, abdicating the use of force, aggressivity, and coercion, and adopting the forces of patience, voluntary suffering, which are the means of love and truth. End of quote. To search this new style of sanctity was a light in Don Aldo's life, and made him abandon definitively his conservative view. When, in 1942, President Getulio Vargas was ousted from power, Father Elder didn't hide his sympathy for the democratic movement, which opposed the Nazi fascist forces in Europe and was against Getulio. In his speech at the graduation ceremony of philosophy in 1944, he said, I quote, the Phariseeism of judging that we, bourgeois, are representatives of the social order and the virtue, while communists incarnate disorder, lack of equilibrium, and evil sources, evil forces, avoid us to see that we too we have our failures and our sins, because we cover glaring social injustice with generous and spectacular alms. End of quote. We see already here the conscience of Don Elder beginning to awaken to the social injustice. This new vision of life and sanctity revealed the great spiritual development that happened in Father Elder's life between 36 and 46. Francis of Assisi became his fundamental reference, and he entered in the illuminative step of his mystical life. When named bishop, he chose as his lemma, in manus tuas, meaning his entire surrendering in the hands of God. The next step of his mystic process will show how this worked in his life. So a mystic with eyes wide open, illumination and union. The great German theologian Johann Baptist Metz believes mysticism were revealed in Judeo-Christianity to be a mystic with open eyes. He says, I quote, the experience of God biblically inspired is not a mysticism of closed eyes, but yes, a mystic with open eyes, not a perception related only with ourselves, but yes, an intensified perception of the suffering of the other, end of quote. The mystic sees the whole of reality under a new light, the light of God. He or she opens wide his, her eyes to perceive what is happening because he or she knows that someone inhabits the last dimension of the real, and this is God. He or she dives within human situations, torn or happy, searching for this presence of God who acts, given life and freedom. Christian mysticism, if it contemplates God, only can do it through the way of the other. The face of the other, of the neighbor, is the only way that make that the contemplative God is not a misleading projection, an alienating fantasy, 
that takes far from reality and claims for justice. That is how the God of the Bible, since the beginning of Israel's itinerary, will reveal himself as the Gohel, the advocate of the orphan, the widow, the foreigner, the poor. That means of all those who didn't have someone to speak for them, mysticism and ethics will be then united forever and reunited in biblical faith. In addition, there is no possibility to live one without the other. In the New Testament, Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth, in whom the first community recognized the Christ of God, will take this golden rule until the last consequences. Through his loving relationship with the Father, Jesus sees people around him, poor, sinners, women, children, sick. Those losers of society don't escape to his compassive looking. Moreover, he re recreates the look recreating simultaneously people's life, who seeing themselves reflected in the mirror of his eyes, rediscover themselves as children, brothers and sisters, human beings with new dignity. The true look of reality has to be capable of measuring itself with the poor, the sick, the marginalized. There resides the proof of conversion, of the love of God and respect of the other, of desire to serve both, heart of the true mystery. Sometimes this awakening of the poor face of reality and the life of the poor comes through other person who is like a mediator. And that happened to Doyle the Cameron. After the Eucharistic Congress of 1955, prepared by him with great success, Doyle started to be unquiet, asking himself why the church, who had influence and prestige in the Eucharistic Congress, was a proof of that. Thousands of people in Rio de Janeiro came, coming from all over the world, convoked by the church. Why the church did not use this prestige to solve Brazil's social problems? The Archbishop of Lyon, France, Cardinal Gerlier, who was in Rio for the Congress, was the voice who enlightened Don Elder about this anguish. Cardinal Gerlier, who followed the performance of the auxiliary bishop of Rio in the organization, of the Eucharistic Congress thought, and he was right, that it was not reasonable that the giant capacity of that Brazilian bishop remained tied to the organization of religious great events. That is why, before returning to France, he asked to talk to him, to Don Elder, to praise his success in the Congress, but much more to throw him a call. That is what he said, and I quote, allow me to talk to you like a brother, a brother in Christ. Don't you think all this religious pageantry is irritating in a city surrounded by favelas, by slums? I have a certain practice in organization, and because of having taken part in this Congress, I have to tell you that you have an exceptional organizational talent. I want you to make a reflection. Why, dear brother Don Elder, don't you put all this talent the Lord gave you at the service of the poor? You should know that Rio de Janeiro is one of the most beautiful cities of the world, but also one of the most amazing because of all those slums in this beauty scenario are insulting the creator." End of quote. Don Elder kissed the hands of the cardinal and told him, I quote, this is a turning point in my life. You will see my consecration to the poor. I don't believe I have exceptional gifts of organization, but the entire gift the Lord gave me, I will put it at the service of the poor." End of quote. From that day on, the slums began to be the place where everyone could see the outfit the bishop. He was no more at the cathedral or at the curia most of the time, or dealing in some cultural milieu, sophisticated milieu, but in the hills where the slums were. In addition, when other religious or bishops came to see him, he would take them to visit those slums and talk to the people there. He made a pioneer project trying to urbanize the slums of Rio de Janeiro, transferring people who lived in one of those to a building. Then was born the Cruzada San Sebastião, which is there in Rio up today. The work of the volunteers there was to form leaders among the inhabitants of the slums themselves. So this is um, an intuition that comes before liberation theology, to empower the poor, to help the poor to be subjects of their history. That's already in the work of Don Elder. The action of Don Elder in the slums 
put him in a path he never left anymore, struggling to attain social justice in, uh, justice in his country, in Latin America, and in the Third World. At Vatican II, he will be called the Bishop of the Favelas, or even the San Vincent de Paul of the Favelas. With his mystic eyes wide open, Don Elder started to see that the problem of injustice don't need or won't be solved only with individual and personal actions, but needs structural changes. He started so an intense work at the Bishop's Conference. He was one of the founders, was the founder of the Bishop's Conference. And putting in the first place the struggle to transform society, promoting justice. That is why, after the Council and following the meetings of the conferences of Medellin and Puebla, respectively in 68 and 79, he was so much attuned with liberation theology. As secretary of the Bishop's Conference, he had conscience of the limits of an assistentialist program to help the poor, and so he started to affirm that, I quote, in the struggle against injustice, 80% of the efforts should be devoted to structural changes and to human promotion, but 20% to help the wounded victims of this struggle, end of quote. In his work at the Bishop's Conference, then, the first priority was to transform society, promoting justice, and that was inseparable of announcing the gospel. He turned to be, in that period, the most important guide of the Brazilian Episcopate. He organized historical meetings with the bishops of the Northeast, uh, a very poor region in Brazil, as the one in Campina Grande in 1956, which will have as conclusion a document stating that, I quote the document, the church don't tie itself to situations of injustice, but it, it situates itself, itself besides the victims of injustice to cooperate with them in a task of recovery and redemption. He led the bishops to enlarge their critical conscience, analyzing the political systems, evaluating which one was more just. In a document named Emergency Plan, the bishops pronounced themselves against the conditions of misery to which capitalism reduced millions of human beings in Brazil. I quote the document, the Emergency Plan, we are solicitous struggling against communism. But not always we assume the same attitude in front of liberal capitalism. We know how to see the dictatorship of the Marxist state. Nevertheless, not always we feel the smashing dictatorship of economy and selfishness in actual structures, which sterilize our efforts of Christianization." End of quote. That option for the poor sealed his entire ministry as Archbishop of Recife at the northeast of Brazil. Where he went, named by Pope Paul VI, Pope, Pope his great friend. In his first speech at the cathedral, he said, and Father Nani probably was there, he said, I quote, It is evident that loving everybody, I must have, following Christ's example, a special love for the poor, continuing with activities already present in our archdiocese. We will take care of the poor, caring mostly for the ashamed poverty and trying to avoid that from poverty there is a decay to misery. In Recife also he inaugurated a new style of being bishop without many formalities. He didn't like his priests to kiss his hand or to call him excellency. And he shared the same crozier with his auxiliary bishop. I found this very cute. Don Josello Martini. They yes. share the same crow. I do. One is enough. <laughs> like good brothers. In 1968, he left the palace of Manguinhos and went to live in a simple room behind the sacristy of the Igreja Nossa Senhora das Fronteiras, the Church Our Lady of the Frontiers. Very appropriate name. At that time, the mystic of the Archbishop grew and got more mature, but also more poetic. His meditations during the night gave him his best inspirations, all of them in the direction of a greater love and closeness to the poor. He started also to be more concerned about violence, weapons, as we heard the, the so moving speech of Ken Buttigan yesterday, nuclear arms, and to make efforts in favor of peace. 
In 1974, Don Elder received, in the name of thousands of anonymous crowds who struggle for justice, the popular prize of peace, with which he could help even more his beloved poor of Brazil. And he was appointed to the Nobel Prize of Peace, but never won it. His participation at the Vatican II offered him a whole program of life with a new model of church, more open, more dialogical, and more close to human beings. Back to Recife and finding a country divided and conflicted by the military dictatorship, Don Elder had to endure a very hard period. Silence, he couldn't speak and was ignored by the media. He started to speak outside Brazil, where he denounced the violations to human rights and the tortures that were happening there. Accused of communists, he had to see members of his clergy persecuted, tortured, and killed he was accused to be a dangerous man. He accepted all these sufferings without the word against the church and without a drop of bitterness. In an interview to the Journal do Brasil, a very important uh, newspaper at that time, he said, and this is a very wonderful quoting, I, I begin the quote, thank God we are not obliged to success. God doesn't ask for victories, but for work, for effort. Success, victory, doesn't depend on us. Thanks God. Many times when we think that failure is total, we are about to have a victory. Nevertheless, the darker the night is, the more we can be sure that it already carries the dawn. End of quote. Don Elder was then a political man, but also a mystical man. Political dimension was, was a dimension of his personality, and a very important one. His work was rooted in prayer, where the devotions to God the Father, to Jesus Christ, Mary, and the saints, and angels, he had a particular guardian angel, whom he called Joseph, <laughs> were always present. In front of all this heavenly court, at night, at night, he planned his work and meditated the big questions of humankind. Totally surrendered to God, he experienced a deep union with his creator, and Savior, where suffering and joy made an always more harmonious synthesis. But there is another point I would like to stress. Don Elder did not only live this mysticism for him. He saw the possibilities of living a mystical life to the others too. And that's the case of his Abrahamic minorities. He was everything but a lonely man. In his prayer and his permanent dialogue with God, he maintained always very lively the presence of all those who had passed by his life and had worked together with him for the gospel. There was place for the group of Rio called the family, from Recife, from abroad. Friends in the Lord, those people, mostly lay, but also religious and priests, mostly women too, began to be his hope and the, of a real change in the world and in the church. Moreover, his growing union with God went together with a deep union with all those friends, like a network, a spiritual network. Even with those who were distant geographically, he even baptized them as the Abrahamic minorities. Looking back over his life, Don Elder talks about his semi-failure, which he describes as the illusions I had about the possibility of mobilizing institutions. He arrives to the conclusion that it's very difficult to mobilize institutions. And then he says, I quote, my hope is the discovery of minorities. They are there, they exist. All you have to do is open your eyes and you can see them. Now we have to make people understand that the day will come and is not far off, when all of these different minorities will be united without being unified. On that day, forgive me for repeating myself, but there are some ideas that need repeating until they become convictions. On the day when we find a way of passing a current through all these minorities to unite them in common priority aims, we shall have discovered the force more powerful than nuclear power itself. And when I, uh, I heard Pilar this morning talking about the forum, I think it's very much that. It is very original, this intuition from Don Elder. Why Abrahamic minorities? Because of Abraham, that is clear. 
father of faith, Abraham was called by God and obeyed without hesitating. He received a lot. He was called to give a lot. That is the core of the Helder intuition. The Abrahamic minorities are those who received much from the Lord. Faith, force, spiritual energy, consolations. To people like them, the Lord gives a lot. Nevertheless, from those, he also asks a lot. There is a story about Santa Teresa of Avila, who was in a horse through Spain, and then the horse fell down, and she fell down too, broke his leg. And she heard God's voice. It's like that that I treat my friends. And she answered, that's the reason why you have so few. <laughs> Receive a lot, you have to give a lot. God, thinking of all, says Don Helder, calls a few. He calls them to jump into the dark, to the park, to walk. He tests them through big sacrifices. However, he also supports them, encourages them, and he gives them the mission to be instruments of the divine cause. He asks them to be discreet presence at the, de at the decisive moment of options. He makes them animators of the itinerary of others, of many others. He makes them signs of God when provisions appear. In those Abrahamic minorities, and that is the wonderful point, Don Eldo includes everyone, not only Christians, also Jews, Muslims, and humanist atheists. To those, he says, go and translate in your language what I say in mine. Where I say God, you can translate but for nature, evolution, humankind. It's very wonderful. Uh, it's fantastic. That means that he addresses to all those who experience hunger of truth, of justice, of love. Isn't that an explicit application of Paul Rana's intuition about the anonymous Christians? And that was so important in Vatican II and then theology after Vatican II? The great Paul Rana, I think is the greatest Catholic theologian of the 20th century, says, I quote, Anonymous Christianity means that the person lives in the grace of God and attains salvation outside of the explicitly constituted Christianity. Let us say a Buddhist monk, that's Runner, always Runner speaking, who, because he follows his conscience, attains salvation and lives in the grace of God. Of him, I must say that he is an anonymous Christian. If not, I would have to presuppose that there is a genuine path to salvation that really attains that goal. But that simply has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But I cannot do that. And so, if I hold, if everyone depends upon Jesus Christ for salvation, and if at the same time I hold that many people live in the world who have not expressly recognized Jesus Christ, then there remains, in my opinion, nothing else but to take up this postulate of an anonymous Christianity." End of quote. Today, the pluralists um, question a lot this intuition of runner. But we have we can't be in a chronicle. At that time it was a great open. And it possibilitated that the interreligious dialogue happened. This is part of Don Elder's mystic. He says the Abrahamic minority is much more a spirit than an organization, much more a mystic than a rigid articulation. And he encourages those who feel that non satisfaction with the world as it is to search for others who feel the same, to join them and to form community. The important is to live fully that uncomfortable, beautiful, and risky vocation to be at the service of humankind as a member of the Abrahamic communities, Abrahamic minorities. And he addresses especially to two groups of people, the artists and the atheists. The first, because they would belong naturally to those who are different, who feel different and want a more beautiful world without the ugliness of injustice. To the last ones, to the atheists, he talks with a great respect, inviting them to join others, perhaps believers or not, for the great causes of humankind, justice, peace, citizenship, compassion. It is the wonderful, mystical, prophetical vision of the Archbishop who includes every man and every woman in the same challenge and the same path disregarding his or her differences of creed, of race, of gender, of ethnicity. The love of God for every creature can unite all in the same desire of serving the world. 
we can notice here important theological insights that Don Elder Mysticism presents that can help men and women in today's world. Well, uh, in today's world, uh, in order to leave some, Bill asked me to leave some minutes to discussion. In the next session of the, this text, you will, will be able to read it after. I raise some theological uh, reflections on the synthesis between contemplation and action that is so present in Don Elder camera. Don Elder didn't think, I will do it rapidly so we can conclude, uh, didn't think that political and mystical were opposed or irreconcilable. Because if all human practice is the result and the corresponding of divine practice, social and political praxis would not be an exception to this rule. Like all human praxis, certainly subject to some criteria, Political and practice can be effectively and often the output of a mystery itself that is nonetheless none an ecstasy or soak in the other in his, her, disfigured and painful reality, identifying with him or her, sympathizing, doing communion with him or her to denounce their situation of pain, of injustice, and allow its transformation. If the ecstasies of the classical mystic are recognized by official religion, but not stressed as the most important criteria for the recognition of the authenticity of their experiences. On the other hand, the concrete works that accompany or follow these ecstasies are certainly the definitive criterion for their degree of authenticity. The life of the mystic is therefore a permanent exodus toward the otherness of God, who inspires him or her and fills him or her with joy and wonder. But in addition, it is a force that pushes them toward the otherness of others in order to always serve more under the inspiration of the same God. The experience of God is far from being a gracious delight in contemplation of the eternal mysteries, but is above all ascending to the world to take one's own responsibility towards those whom from the bosom of this figure and unjust reality cry out for justice and compassion. If the word mysticism is rooted in mystery, and the mystical experience means, in short, experience of intimacy with the mystery, it is not only the mystery of otherness that shines from the bottom of reality at the same time that transcends, but also a mystery of responsibility in which, in which each one is responsible for others. Experience in his or her flesh the consequences and the weight of an evil not practiced and is part of a cooperative economy of redemption they did not invent and then they do not preside. This is where mysticism and politics more clearly show their possibility of intersection. The God who acts and works in the world is the condition of possibility and mainspring of human practices. Experience in his mystery that God will raise by one human act that is no longer his but inextricably intertwined in one movement with the act of God. Finding God, human beings will thus find both the world and the others and contemplate God in synonymous with making happen in the middle of reality with all its ambiguities and problems, the kingdom of God. The human beings is though the recipient of the divine practice and is the reproducer the channel, the mediation for, by which, through which, this praxis will attain the whole world. It is one that human beings is the one that while receiving passively and actively cooperating with his, her strength and possibilities, with this divine praxis, this ceaseless work that aims to bring all the things desired and free to the communion with the Creator, every human praxis will be, therefore, in the light of Christian theology, result from the practice of God. This was certainly the north that compassed and guided the life of Bishop Elder Cameron. He never rested or remained silent to the suffering of others. Moreover, he suffered the consequence of his solidarity. He continued tirelessly until his death. The same man who got up at dawn to hear the stars through which his Lord narrated him its his mysteries, wrote beautiful poetry and prayers in these inhabited nights 
illuminated by the presence of the created, of the creator, who was walking barefoot through the favelas of Recife, who faced powerful men and governors to plant in the southern zone of Rio de Janeiro public housing for the poor to live decently, who organized campaigns in favor of the plague by the break of Oros Weir, who made extensive travels around the world preaching in favor of peace and disarmament, he is the synthesis of contemplation and action. I conclude, from all that has been said by us so far, and that only very fragile and lightly rubs the problem as its immeasurable greatness remains a deep core belief. The Christian mystical experience is the experience of otherness. An otherness which ties anthropology and, theolo and theology inextricably united. Therefore, it is not an experience that immobilizes in a contemplation that closed eyes, but the one that opens and mobilizes the body for service to the poor and unhappy of the world. Not only is it an experience of the transcendent pure and simple, or something that humans move from the floor of the reality toward a supernatural level or a nirvana located elsewhere, in a space that is not clear where to situate, that goes in search of sensations and waiting for the seizing of all concerns related to reality and the hardness of human humanity. The mystical experience in Christianity is the experience of an incarnate God. Outside the central and necessary experience, there is no Christianity. There is no incarnation. There is no possibility of God bearing all things and live inside history step by step, so to speak, against the grain of his eternity. There is no incarnation, no cross, no redemption, no salvation. There is therefore no covenant between the flesh and the spirit. Surely, this is the greatest contribution, as far as I think, that Christian mysticism has to give today in times of resacralization, seeking transcendence and new paradigms, including spirituality. Nothing that is human is alien to Christian mysticism every new discovery and every new emphasis in terms of humanity come not to threaten Christian mysticism, but rather to feed it, to nurture it, to make it more according to the dream of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that everything and everyone is Christified, sanctified by the practice which guides history and works inside the flesh of the world. Every attempt, however, to escape it is temptation that fits the Christian mystic in his personality, in his Trinitarian setting, in his, his historical and incarnational dynamic. To confess with the mouth and the heart that the Word became flesh and the Spirit was poured out on all flesh implies seeking experience of union with God who thus determines to communicate with humanity through this flesh in which it's possible to experience Him. And this flesh is the flesh of the other who suffers oppression and injustice and whose face reveals the God who has always acted in their defense and as his lawyer. To integrate the flesh of the other in the ineffable experience of divine love is the great challenge that today, as always, is put to Christian spirituality and mysticism. Witnesses and masters, as Donald the camera, thank God, do not let us forget this fundamental fact. I'm going to ask you if you can just stay here mm -hmm. because we'll um, take some questions in a moment. And we'd uh, like to ask people who are going to ask uh, Maria questions to please use the microphone uh, that's there. Uh, and um, I just want to say that it was um, uh, a wonderful experience and opportunity for us to be here with you and listen to this, uh, your presentation. There were so many valuable things. I, I could pick out one if I. Um, uh, very valuable thing that when you called the bishop the Saint Vincent of the favelas, I thought that was a very, but I wanted to highlight that point and, uh, and make sure that everybody caught that um, important point. But uh, uh, your, um, as as I listened to it and as we listened to it, we couldn't help but see the the correlation between this wonderful bishop and our present Pope Francis, and we can see uh, in many ways. Um, that we would hope that Pope Francis is walking in these same steps and that the influence that this uh, bishop had 
on all, uh, so many of the bishops, and including our present pontiff. But uh, especially we're delighted as we listen to this presentation about how you've opened up the whole area of mysticism. And I, I think as a, 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 just seeing as a, a picture, breaking down St. John of the Cross and his castle, and now breaking down the walls that mysticism is somehow contained in the monastery, and opening it up to see that it's part and parcel of liberation theology, and if it's, uh, it's that a foundation that moves us from religion as piety uh, and religion as a personal experience uh, of connected to law to one that is embracive and open to following Christ and conforming our lives to Christ. Um, you redefine mysticism in two uh, beautiful ways. First, you said that it's intimacy with mystery, intimacy with mystery. Secondly, you said that it's exodus to the other a wonderful opening of a whole understanding of mysticism that transcends the very simple idea. Um, because I doubt that uh, Thomas Aquinas, in studying uh, his own purgative, um, illuminative, and unitive way, if you read up through the um, mid-20th century, what you see in that illuminative way is that um, um, the manualist actually gave years to those. So you were in the purgative way until you were 35. Um, and then you were in the illuminative way until you were 55. And then you joined the unitive way after 55. It was a very static, it was a very uh, um, a clear and uh, uh, passage, and you've broken down that and, and moved in such great um, ways. I would say that, um, I would sum it up by saying that uh, your presentation brought this man alive uh, as a mystical provocateur. So he saw that mysticism was uh, meant to challenge himself and others to personal and social transformation. To be real, mysticism has uh, adjure sequitur essay. It's what you do that um, uh, shows who you are. And so your presentation was a wonderful introduction for many of us into this spirituality. It was a, um, a challenging interest in, in, inter, uh, um, intersection into the understanding of mysticism. And so I want to uh, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful presentation and for uh, the wonderful foundation you've given us. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, I would um, uh, like to invite uh, any of you who wish to uh, make use of the microphone and uh, uh, bring your questions. And she has an answer. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope. Uh, first of all, just a moment. Hey. Uh, first of all, I just uh, I would like to to inspire by Professor Pilar. We talk about, she talks about gratitude. I would like to express, if you don't mind, my gratitude for Maria Clara in my own life as a student. Uh, I am from Brazil, and Maria Clara had played a uh, very important role in my intellectual formation, uh, especially when I was a young student in my early 20s. In 2009, I was thinking about studying. Simone Veil, and she invites me for a conference in Rio de Janeiro. I was in Sao Paulo, and she didn't know me. She, I just talked with her occasionally about, I was in the study Simone Veil, and she invited me to go to a conference there. And I told her, I cannot go because I don't have money. Uh, and she said, don't worry about that. Come, I pay for you. <laughs> And she doesn't know me, and in that moment I had the opportunity to introduce me to some French professors, and eventually I went to France to res make research about Simone Veil. And it seems that uh, Maria Clara has played an important uh, role in my education. And I'd like to say thank you in public here. I don't know if I have that opportunity in my life. Now I am in the United States doing my PhD, and she still encouraged me in my study. So thank you very much for youth, your youthness your testimony in my life, and your support. Uh, but my question uh, is a very simple question. 
Uh, unfortunately, Donald Cameron is not from my time in life. Uh, I had the opportunity to know another great bishop in Brazil, uh, and he died when I was working in a hospital in Brazil, uh, Don Luciano Mendes de Almeida, when he died in the Sao Paulo Hospital of Clinics, and I was working there at that time. And I just mentioned because my question go about uh, don't have a camera, as you told us, it's a very uh, important to put together contemplation and action. And his mystical experience was essential for he changed his life. Without mystic, he, he could not make change his life. People, the bishop from as a bishop of Lyon say something, but was God was playing him and God his mystical experience made him became the other the other camera we know now. My question is, do you think there is space for the other camera legacy in our episcopate, our bishops nowadays, among, especially in Brazil? Because I cannot see that anymore. I, when the other camera uh, get retired, emeritus, and Olinda Recife, the new bishop was put there, they, he started to destroy it, what the other started. To build, and Yvonne Shebara, when talk I hear her was a Yvonne Shebara was a America feminist liberation theologian walk hand by hand with Don Elder Cameron. She went there with Comblan and others to ask Don Elder do something. He's destroying what we started with you, and Don Elder don't say anything. He just say the church is my time is gone. I have to believe the church is led by the Holy Spirit, and he chose the option to be quiet in the house the last years of his life. He didn't take anything until he dies in the 90s, in the uh, late 90s. Uh, so my question is, there is a space for Don Elder the camera legacy in Latin America, especially the entire church, but especially in Brazilian church. There is a space, even with Francis, I just was talking, no, nothing changed in Brazil. We still appoint bishops from Opus Dei, conservative bishops, the, the new the priest, can be with the same way before Francis, nothing changed in practice, except you can see a good witness from Francis. So my question, there is, uh, is there a space for Don Eda Camera in Brazilian Episcopate nowadays, or the bishops don't have mysticism? It's need God among the bishops. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wouldn't say that bishops don't have mysticism. <laughs> they must have their mysticism, of course. They are very holy people. <laughs> But, um, well, Alexandre, I understand your anguish, and I can share it. Um, <laughs> we had, after the Vatican II, 26 years of a very different pontificate. Paul VI was a hero, I think, because Vatican II was a brrr, no? made the church tremble in many ways, and Paul VI was faithful to the spirit of uh, the, the, the council, so I'm very happy he is beatified right now. But afterwards, we saw the conservative wave coming. Um, the, the recently deceased friend, uh, mine and yours, Jean Battista Libanio, who is in this book too, I think he, what it was his last article, in this book. he died in January of this year. Uh, he wrote a book, The Return of the Great of the Big Discipline, of the Grand Discipline. So, and it was a very long pontificate. And the strategy was to name bishops of a different line. With Holland it was quick, because it was seven bishops. Well, with Brazil, 400, it was a little more difficult. But we feel today that this generation, you know, uh, that Don Elder is a little bit the primogenitus, and Don Luciano belongs to it, many other, is now becoming old and dying. And the new bishops are not at all in the same line. Um, in spite of that, and Father Anani could speak much better than I myself, because he works in the bishops' conference, there are good bishops. But I think this is a challenge to us. You are religious. I am a lay person. We can't let the church depend on the bishops. That's it. 
the church is not resumed to the bishops. Of course, the bishops are very important. They are important. And they, uh, during the older time and after it, they gave a capteromotom. I don't know how do you say this in English. They, they make a, a, a stress, a, a tune. But I think now um, we, we must have the Abrahamic minorities have to take the thing in, the thing in hand. And the church, we are responsible for the church, I think. We are responsible for the gospel, not only the bishops. We, we must not uh, remain waiting what the bishops are doing or not doing. Because this discourages <laughs> us. As, uh, as yourself, I can imagine a, a young religious, as you, as you are a young theologian, it's discouraging. Uh, it's really discouraging. But uh, I think we have to organize ourselves. That's what, that's what Don Elder would do, I think. <laughs> or at least that's what Don Elder would encourage us to do. We have to take things in hand and go like the mustard seed of the grain of uh, uh, fermento, I don't know how it was, what's the word in English, to make the gospel be alive. I think initiatives like the forum, for instance, is a very important thing. So our association of theologians, Soter, you know, is a big, is the second biggest in the world. The first is the North American, and the, the second is Soter. And it's a, a very original and particular society of theology because we discuss social issues, dialoguing with theology. I was very happy that Pilar stressed that today. Initiatives like that we should support and we should encourage we give her, but I don't know if I gave you a satisfying answer, but is the answer I can give myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for being fire. as always. Um, this is probably a poor question just before lunch when we're running late. Um, but I'm wondering if you can help me to understand whether there's a discontinuity in Don Elder's spiritual journey or whether it's a a discontinuity in the, the nature of interreligious engagement is presently constituted. Um, we heard last night from Ken Budigan talking about Don Helder's journey leading him to a point on the way, the way of Jesus, where it's not merely the end, but the means that comes to be determinative of the gospel for him, where he says that he would much rather be killed a thousand times than to kill someone. That's one of the that seems to be one of the distinctive aspects of Christianity that doesn't translate into a secular language, doesn't necessarily have analogs in other major religious traditions, even in, even in Buddhism, which for several thousand years has had you know, castes of warrior monks, just as the Christians have had. Um, to the extent that Don Helder's spiritual journey led him to the point of understanding that to really live the Christian life is to renounce is to renounce lethal means, especially in the service of good ends, love, justice, the poor. Um, to make the jump then toward the sorts of interreligious engagement where those questions of means tend to be subsumed, and I'm wondering if that's that's a if there's a if there's an issue there to be discussed or whether that's just part of the fall. for a question. I think I can link part of your question with something that Alexander told also. He was astonished why when the, the bishop who succeeded him came and destroyed his whole work, he didn't speak anything, he didn't denounce it. He, he was quiet. Uh, yeah, I think that um, Don Elder, as a true mystic, mystic had the clear notion that uh, the future of the world, of history, of Christianity, didn't depend on him. And well, he, he gave the maximum he could. He gave himself entirely. Uh, but there are limits to our power or to our possibility of acting. And when those limits arrived, for instance, for him, he couldn't imagine himself going against the church and struggling with his brother in the episcopate. For him, it's, it was not an issue. It was not a possibility. Other people decided differently. Hmm? Uh, a 
uh, the people broke with the church. Okay, so St. Luther, who was a mystic himself, Luther chose this way. Don Eldor would never choose this way. I saw Don Luciano, who was a holy bishop, cry. But cry, really. Telling how humiliated he was in the Vatican. They left him two weeks waiting. You will be the last to be received by the Pope. Never invited him to have lunch because he was seen as a liberation supporter, etc. So I think there are moments, there are situations where, well, faith in its broad sense has to be there. Uh, but I think also that this vision that Don Elder had, this universal vision, that um, for the human causes, the deep human causes, we don't need to be only with Catholics. We can be together with Buddhists, with atheists, with that for me is a great hope. Hmm? Uh, when I don't, I, when I'm very much convinced of something and I don't find any support in my church, well, I can be together with other churches, with people of other religions, of people who don't believe or not believers. Uh, the important is that there are situations that are anthropological, anthropologically evident. When human life is in danger, when the future of humankind is in danger. I think this, for me, is an important legacy of Don Elder. And we can learn from him on that. I don't know if I answered your question. It's a very rich question. It has several points. I think we are coming to the uh, end of our um, uh, presentation because we have to move on in a few minutes. So we'll take this as our last question. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but remembering that this is not the end of the conversation, but the beginning. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, I would like to ask about the nature of his mysticism. Uh, because he, he seems to be, you know, mysticism to me is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. One that we don't earn, it's just given by God. And so I'm trying to get to the mysticism of America. And in essential writings, this backs up exactly what you were saying, Dr. Rickmeyer that he would get up in the night to recall the faces and the conversations of the poor people he had met during the day. The luminous passages or the prayer from the poor were characterized by his constant awareness of the presence of his brothers and sisters in Christ. And it seems to me that he was a contemplative in the marketplace, but his energy came from the voices of the poor that he was not afraid to look at in his own prayer. And this animated him to be freer of the church to the kingdom, whatever. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's, it's a very important point that you raised there. The mysticism of the elder was made of, of course, intimacy with God. For him, the mass, the daily mass was a very important. And it was a short mass, very re collected. Not he didn't uh, use the mass to, because, for, in, for instance, Monsignor Romero had his homilies. With his homilies, he moved the whole country. No, Don Elder had a very intimate mass with few people around, and this was very important for him. It, it uh, feed it. It was a food for him, and also in the nights. Uh, in the nights, he. He didn't separate hearing the voice of God and the voice of the poor people. That's it. Uh, he could make that synthesis. Uh, uh, the things we, he heard during the day in the slums, in the mocambos of Recife, and pass this by God's filter, you know, and to, to see them with the light of God. I think this was the secret of his force, of his energy, and of his very enlightened intuition of his poetry too. He has lots of poetry, books of poetry. And there was always during those nights, those vigils, those. So I think it's, a, I try to synthesize his mysticism, mysticism of eyes wide open. Hmm? Eyes open to God, of course, but eyes open to reality too. 
and he integrated the, that in a very harmonic synthesis, I think. So once again, we want to say a, a word of thanks for your very, very uh, uh, wonderful and provocative uh, presentation um, and uh, enlightening presentation on the mysticism of Dom Helder. So thank you once again.